Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was looking back, and it's interesting. Today is the one-year anniversary of us gathering for Sunday morning services in this online format. And uh, what a year it has been. Uh, while it's not a year that we would have ever wanted to have happen, uh, I do celebrate that throughout this time we have been able to uh, worship together, that we have been able to offer and receive ministry together, and that we have been together during this whole time. And so in that sense, I celebrate. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and it is one of the most celebrated Sundays in all of the Christian tradition. It is a glorious day, but it is also a day which has a hidden darkness to it. And today, I want to uh, set the stage for what Palm Sunday is, but also explore it in a way in which we discover what was going on on that day and what it all meant from many different angles. So to set the stage just a bit, uh, we have uh, an event in which Jesus is trying to show his followers and those beyond his followers that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, and that his message, his message is one of love and of peace. However, he realizes that while there has been a response to his message, and there have been those who have rallied around that message and have become followers of his as a rabbi. His intended message is not fully getting through. And that's where some of that hidden darkness comes into the story. In fact, for many, his message has been misinterpreted by personal interests and he felt like he needed to make uh, a dramatic showing uh, uh, in action of what, uh, which would portray his message. He chose the city of Jerusalem at Passover, and this was a large gathering in which uh, he would show this action. Uh, the law of the land at the time stated that every male Jew within 20 miles of Jerusalem had to come to the city for Passover. However, in addition to that, Jews from all corners of the earth made their way to Jerusalem. And so it's estimated that there were approximately 2.5 million pilgrims that were in Jerusalem for Passover. And so with that as a backdrop, uh, we now have the event of Palm Sunday, in which Jesus enters Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, a colt which had never been ridden. Uh, the disciples placed their cloaks on the donkey and then assisted Jesus onto it. Uh, the crowds line the streets and they spread their cloaks on the road and others cut down branches from the trees and they strewed those on the road as well in front of Jesus as he entered into the city of Jerusalem. And the crowd shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a wonderful celebration of Jesus and what a captivating spectacle this must have been. However, the perceptions that were around him did not match the reality that lie before him. And once again, this is where that hidden darkness comes into play. Perceptions not matching reality. So let's talk about the different characters, if you will, in the story, as well as the different perceptions, the different angles of their perceptions that come into play. 
First of all, we have the crowd that we talked about. The crowds line the streets and they threw their cloaks onto the road in front of Jesus as he rode in on this donkey. And um, they threw branches down, uh, palms, uh, onto the road in front of him. However, the perception of the crowd was that which came from a place of personal interest. The crowd was looking for a savior, but they were looking for a nationalistic savior, one who would be historic and would establish a place for their people. In the psalm uh, that was shared earlier in this service, it describes a king's difficult battle and it gives thanks for a victory that delivered the nation from enemies. And the people in the psalm shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is where that phrase comes from. And we hear it again here on Palm Sunday. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And let's pause there for just a little bit because those words show us the perception of the crowd in the word Hosanna. Hosanna means save. Save us. Save us now. It also means help. Hosanna is a word and a phrase that you can hear in other scriptures. Um, and it's often used to address kings specifically. In 2 Samuel uh, chapter 14, verse 4, a woman says to the king, Help me, your majesty. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 26, another woman cries out to her king, Help me, my lord, the king. Hosanna, save, save me now. Hosanna, help me. These are phrases that you say to a king. And so the crowd looked at Jesus as a king, but a king who would save them from a nationalistic perspective. And even in the book of John then, it goes on to say, not only blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but it says, blessed is the king of Israel. Nationalistic. Establishment of ruler of land. Ruler of an area. One who can save the people within that area. And so we have the crowd who gathers on Palm Sunday, celebrating Jesus as he comes down the road, but celebrating Jesus with their own personal interest. That is the perception that they bring to the event. Let's talk about another group that was there on Palm Sunday and what was their perception. The other group is the disciples. The disciples come to this event, but they come with a perception which lacks understanding. They come with a perception that does not fully grasp and understand the moment, and therefore interprets it, interprets it from a position of near ignorance. They come to this event and what they perceive is the culmination. A culmination which results in a victory, a celebration, a realization of a vision that they have been a part of and have been pursuing for three years now. As they left their occupations, they left their families, they left their homelands in order to follow this rabbi, Jesus, whom they recognized as the Son of God. And they saw this moment as the beginning of the realization of the vision that they had been working for and with Jesus for this whole time. And they are now caught up in the moment. And their view is that from here, from here, we have arrived, everything gets better. This is the grand beginning.
However, they had the clues for a greater understanding. They had been presented to them, but they just didn't realize it in the moment that they were caught up in. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, O shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So they have this scripture from, from Zechariah that tells them what this moment is all about. And yet, they don't realize it. Just recently, in their own experience with Jesus, Jesus had told them. He explained that he was on the path to Jerusalem. And at Jerusalem, he would be killed. And they said, I remember this, Peter said, well, let's not go to Jerusalem. This is easy. We turn around. We go somewhere else. Why go there? And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. This is the path that I'm on. and We need to go to it. They had heard these words. They had been told what was coming up. And yet in this moment that they get caught up in it, they lose sight of that. So at first, his disciples did not understand all of this. And it even says in the book of John, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. And so we have the disciples who are approaching the moment from the perception of a lack of understanding. And another perception that is within the crowd is that of the Pharisees. And theirs is a perception of impatience. When they see all of this happening and they hear the roar of the crowds and the shouting, the Pharisees say to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Their impatience tells them it is time to take the next step. We need to eliminate this threat. Once we eliminate it, the threat will be gone. And so that is the perception that they bring to this moment. So we have these different perceptions that are misguided and misaligned. And then we overlay that with Jesus and the reality which he understands. He understands that the cross is just on the horizon. He has been on this path for a long time. He knows where it leads. He knows where it ends. He knows this reality in the midst of all these perceptions that are around him. And Jesus, for the crowd, allows them to have their hope. But his reality was that this was his last chance to get his message through. He rode a donkey instead of a horse. He did not ride on a nationalistic, as a nationalistic conqueror, but rather he rode as a sign of peace. By riding the colt, he showed them that he was the Messiah and that he represented peace and love from his heavenly parent. His only hope would be that maybe, just maybe, they'll see in retrospect what his message is. They'll see his message with new eyes. They'll see his message through a new lens. For the disciples, his reality was that this was not the grand beginning. This was the beginning of the torturous end. The teaching was nearly done. He had worked with them now for three years. And they are now in their final review and they're entering into the period uh, that in high school and college we refer to as the cram session. As a teacher, he had to be thinking, I hope I've done enough. I hope my words and my examples have been sufficient for them. And for the Pharisees, Jesus' reality was that he was to be the Savior. 
and it would require his courage. Knowing he was a wanted man, he didn't enter into the city of Jerusalem in the cover of night, but rather he entered publicly in full view, showing the reality of who he was and what he stood for. So we have this clash, this clash of the perception of the crowd and the disciples and the Pharisees versus the reality which Jesus understood was just days away for all of them. Reality is about to set in. As Wayne phrased it last week in his message, quantum changes are before them. They will be transformed. They will never be the same. They are about to enter the one-way door that generally leads to permanent transformation for the recipients. For the crowds, it took time and effort. But over the years and over the centuries, reality set in in the form of Christ's message, which took root and blossomed and is why we are here this morning celebrating Palm Sunday. For the disciples, they quickly saw and slowly began to understand the reality before them. In the next few days, reality hits them hard. And their first reaction is to try to find their previous reality. Peter famously said, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to get back to what I know. Jesus had to help them to understand. And from that understanding, they stumbled and they sought and they stumbled and they sought to find their Savior and to find their way forward. And today, we give thanks for their quantum change and their transformation. And for the Pharisees, their prophecy proved to be wrong. Their impatience was not rewarded. Their instant gratification of the cross became the symbol which sustained the movement and is universally recognized today. For Jesus, reality loomed ominously. In that moment, as Palm Sunday unfolded, the future was uncertain. There were no guarantees, only perceptions and reality. The perceptions, they were destined to be dashed. The hope was that the transformative reality would survive. We celebrate Palm Sunday today, not because of the perceptions and the celebrations, but because the reality Jesus sought was transformative and it did survive. Our role now is to continue to seek, discover, and align with Jesus' reality to be transformed by his message. Now, let's be clear, though. We like to look at the crowd and look at the disciples and look at the Pharisees and say, wow, their perception was wrong. But let's be clear. Just like the crowd, each of us formed Jesus into our own personal interests. Just like the disciples, each of us lack understanding. Just like the Pharisees, each of us act on our impatience. And after all of this, Jesus' full reality has not been achieved. But the beauty of Christianity is that through effort and grace and prayer and repentance, it is available for all of us. This week, as Easter awaits, the promise made centuries ago still calls us forward. Seek, and ye shall find Jesus' transformative reality for you. I enjoy our time together each week. I look forward to Easter week which lies before us. And I hope you have a wonderful and transformative week. Thank you.